Castlewood Drive had the most beautiful trees I had ever seen in my life. The minute we turned down the street, you know, you could see the trees canopying over and, and the way that it sort of crests down, it was amazing. I was trimming my trees last year. My neighbor comes over as I'm cutting them and she's like, you know, you shouldn't be cutting your trees, you know, at this time. I'm like, well, I mean, why not? You know, she's like, because the oak wilt. And I was like, oh, I don't even have any oak trees. And she, she basically looks me in the eyes and I've had beers with this lady. Like, she's like my grandma. And she's like, I'm going to sue you if my trees die. bought this home here in Castlewood liking the neighborhood and, and, and really specifically the trees because it was such a highly treed area and it's kind of like an oasis in itself for this eight square block area and there's not many areas like this. If you go on Google Maps yeah. and do the satellite view you will see a square of green this, and if you zoom in it's Castlewood it's Forest. Little. One thing I found about the trees is they actually become this like common bond between property owners. You know, this oak out here, but while it's on our neighbor's property, it, it hangs, over ours. hangs over ours. And so it's become something that he and I talk about. I'm not one to peaceably protest and set up demonstrations and everything, but when he first told me that thing was coming down, I almost chained myself to it. You were, was, you were really upset. I was really upset about it, but it's so beautiful. I mean, it looks like something out of old Disney cartoon. But it has no leaves. I mean, it's black. I would assume oak rot or oak wilt did it. I started work with the city of Austin in August of 1993. My, my job was to, to develop the oak wilt suppression project for the city of Austin. It has a way of infecting and eliminating large populations of trees very quickly. What happens is it could be a, a wind damage that exposes fresh tissue on the tree and a limb breaks. It could have been someone out pruning, uh, exposing a fresh wound on the susceptible oak. And the fungus actually gets translocated, or we call it vectored in, on an insect. It's called a nitidulid beetle. It's a small sap feeding beetle that's been over here in the forest and the other in the town feeding on infected red oaks. It got the fungus spores on its body on a Sunday morning pruning their tree at the wrong time of year. That insect is attracted to the sap on that tree and it inadvertently brings that oak wilt fungal spore on its body through that fresh wound on that tree and the fungus enters the tree through the vascular system. You're off and running because all the live oaks in the neighborhood are connected through a community root system. So it'll go like dominoes from tree to tree to tree to tree, cutting off the water supply from the crowns and the trees wilt and die. There are neighborhoods now where it's almost the equivalent of a wildfire going through. These infection centers have been here long enough and they've spread so big that there really isn't much that can be done. You can put containment around it, but it isn't going to do good for anything on the inside. The trees have been taken away or are going to be taken away. It's like starting over. I was fascinated with oak wilt and how this disease could be addressed within an urban area. If suppression of this disease could be effectively brought from rural areas where you know bulldozing and tree elimination was common, could it be effectively done in urban areas? Can a cost-effective means of suppression be implemented within a neighborhood? And, and that was one of the defining factors which brought me to Castle, to that neighborhood at that time to better understand if we are going to implement a suppression project, what will it take? When the oak wilt epidemic came along and started killing a lot of the oak trees in the neighborhood, that was very sad for some people because they had some lovely big trees. Going into the fall of 93, into the spring of 94, I remember the kickoff meetings at the church. The turnout from the neighborhood was remarkable. And these projects we knew at the time, if we were going to make these work, it's going to involve the cooperation of the neighborhood. The neighborhood had to be vested in it. And that first meeting at the church on Manshack Road answered that question. I had standing room only. It was a way of people getting to know each other in not the best of circumstances, but also it, it kind of brings out the neighborliness 
and the solidarity that the, the neighborhood is a neighborhood rather than just a collection of, of people living there. After that meeting, I got to go ahead and start looking at a plan. The first objective there is where is the oak wilt within the neighborhood? So I started a systematic evaluation of the neighborhood, mapping all of these trees. And I must have been at it for a couple of months. And at the end, I had a map of the neighborhood where the oak wilt was. So it turned out that these infection centers in this neighborhood were relatively numerous, but they were small and containable. When I got to Castlewood, there were some areas where we've had oak wilt sitting for probably a decade. And it was oak wilt from the outside of the neighborhood association that moved across the streets into it which happens most of the time. Other ones, it was insect carried to, to, I think, to the rest of them and started with single tree infections that started to grow. We came together to do a project uh, to trench in the neighborhood, but the fact that they had put sewage lines in the streets meant that for all practical purposes, the city had already trenched every street for us. Um, by putting the sewer lines through the middle of the street. So there was some trenching that needed to be done between trees. Bringing in a rotary rock saw and going around these infection centers, these dead trees, breaking the root connections between them and healthy adjacent trees. Meetings all over the neighborhood seemed like every other night in a different living room. We all talked about the logistics. My husband was chairman of the Oakwell Committee and uh, we had several meetings here at our house. And I remember we'd have a group of homeowners around a kitchen table cheering, you know, you know, and off we would go. One way they raised money was just to go to the neighbors and ask for donations. I think we started out asking for like $25 a household. I think we went back a second time to raise more money and then we took some money from the Covenant Treasury to, as seed money to start the Oakwell Fund. We raised enough money that the city was willing to give us a grant to help pay for the whole project. It was the largest contiguous trenching project that I think anyone has done in Texas at the time. We had to get permission from homeowners to trench across their lots. Um, which was a problem sometimes. I remember at home one night I got a call from a homeowner saying, you trench across my yard and my toilet won't flush. <laughs> Trenches had to be hand dug around some of that kind of infrastructure because um, you couldn't bring in a big machine to do it. Obviously, it, it's not called Castlewood Oak Valley for nothing. Not only do we like our large lots and our shade and our, our pretty uh, foresty area, but there's an investment value uh, to these trees. We find now conservatively in Austin that the trees on a landscape can comprise up to 20% of the property value or more. People know a lot more about oak wilt now than they did 20 years ago. They had a beautiful oak tree out in front of their house and they trimmed it at the wrong time of the year. He just trimmed it in the springtime. You're supposed to either the dead of winter or the dead of summer trim your oaks. And I had the arborist and he was telling me I needed to trench around my trees to protect them and had a guy come out and they wanted five or six thousand dollars just to trench to make sure the root systems were cut. And that was probably about five, six years ago, and it, it didn't affect anybody. I think they were able to, to cut the tree down and get rid of it before it spread. When you take a look at the relatively small amount of money that was invested, it turns out pretty wisely a while back, and the benefits now, it was, it was a tremendous success. What we learned and what I learned in the Castlewood project uh, those tools came to bear for the rest of my career, dealing with neighborhoods and suppression. And I don't care if it's 20 years later in a neighborhood in San Antonio, it's still that basic agenda that we had put together in a living room at Collingwood Drive 25 years ago. I still find that amazing.
every single neighbor I've met here is truly invested in Castlewood Forest. You would like to think that people invest in the neighborhood enough to come to know its history and not only appreciate what the previous generations of homeowners did on behalf of the neighborhood, but that even when they don't realize it, that they're the heirs to previous generations, that they continue that work. Having seen what I've seen and having done what we had done in the neighborhood, I know from experience that if that group hadn't been there working with us, that we would have lost blocks of trees. I see canopies when I drive through that neighborhood now that I know would not be there. I know would not be there if it wasn't for that effort. It taught us that, yes, suppressing Oakwood within urban areas is possible. But in order to get to the trees, you gotta get the people on board. If it wasn't for the actions of a small group of people a long time ago, looking out for this neighborhood and how it looked even, even after they die. And I always think about that. I'm always gonna be grateful to have been associated with them.